Hello and welcome to my Physics Online Video Lecture Supplement Series. Today's video is going to be the beginning of lecture set number one for a Physics 2 course. So this lecture set is covering oscillations and waves and we'll be using the lecture notes for my uh, second semester sequence of physics. These notes are actually for the Physics with Calculus course. This lecture is going to actually be broken into four parts, and today's video is going to be the first of those four parts. Basically what we're interested in here is topics that pertain to oscillations and to waves. So we're going to be considering what an oscillation is, what kind of objects make for oscillators, um, specifically for what are known as simple harmonic oscillators, and we're going to jump from there into wave motion and we're going to consider different kinds of mechanical waves. And after doing that we will consider the particular type of mechanical wave which is sound. But those are the next set of uh, parts to this lecture set. Basically parts two, three, and four. Today we're looking at part one which is just about springs. And the point of this is that we're actually going to be considering simple harmonic oscillators next and perhaps the simplest of simple harmonic oscillators is the ideal spring. So we want to consider springs before moving on to talk about other types of oscillators and so on. So if you ignore friction and other types of damping a spring really is a simple harmonic oscillator. What that basically means is that it's going to undergo periodic motion. Uh, these are the oscillations. And specifically what makes it a simple harmonic oscillator is the fact that the acceleration of a mass attached to the end of a spring, of an ideal spring, is linearly proportional to the displacement from the equilibrium position. But before we go into the oscillatory properties of a spring, we want to look at a few of the other properties of the spring, namely its elastic properties and how you deal with forces with springs and, and what kind of energy is stored in a spring, etc. So let's begin by considering the elasticity of a spring. So there are three basic types of elasticity which I introduced in the Physics 1 course, or in the first semester of physics. Uh, these three types are basically elasticity in length, which basically goes with what's called tensile or compressive elasticity. And all that means is that if you attempt to stretch an object out or push it together so it compresses, then the object will resist being stretched or compressed. So if you pull upon the object it will stretch out a little bit but as soon as you release it it will attempt to restore itself to its original length. The second type is elasticity in shape which is sometimes called shear elasticity and that is resisting uh, being bent, twisted, uh, surfaces within the object sliding across each other, etc. And then last but not least, we have elasticity in volume, which is called the bulk elasticity, and that is that uh, you cannot compress an object and have it keep that shape or stretch an object out and keep that shape in three dimensions. So it's sort of a three-dimensional version in some sense of the elasticity in length. So of these three, the one that's actually most important to us for the purpose of discussing springs is elasticity in length. So I show this plot in the Physics 1 course, and I talk about, about it then. And what it is is basically a plot of stress versus strain for, uh, for example, a spring, but in general for any object with uh, length elasticity. And what it is, to review a little bit of what those two terms mean, Stress often is represented by a sigma is basically how much force per unit area is being applied to this object. Strain is how much change in length do you get per unit initial length. Let us consider a cylindrical bar, for example. And so the cylindrical bar has 
a radius of r and therefore it has a cross-sectional area a is equal to pi r squared and basically what we're doing is we're applying a force on this bar that is upward perpendicular to this area so therefore the total stress that we are applying to this thing is the force F divided by the area, or in other words, F over pi r squared. If for some reason we were to decide to uh, push inward, we would get the same equation here. And if instead of having a uh, bar of circular cross-section, we have one of, let's say, uh, rectangular or square cross-section like so, then you apply your upward force, we'll call this x, we'll call this y, we'll call this z, then sigma becomes f divided by x times y. And if we were to instead apply the force outward here, f2, then sigma2 would be f2 divided by this cross-sectional area, which is z times y. So that's basically what's happening as far as stress is concerned. Okay, so now let's look at this graph that we have down here, the stress versus strain graph. There is some region for which stress and strain are linear with respect to each other. The elastic or linear region is the one that we're actually most concerned with for a spring. For what it's worth, there are other regions. For example, between A and C, you stop getting a linear response, although you haven't necessarily damaged the spring. When you get to point C, in other words, when you add enough stress to where you're at C, or enough strain to where you're at C, what happens is that you sort of permanently deform the spring. And so that is your plastic region. And then at some point you get a necking region and a fracture or break point. In other words, if you pull on the spring hard enough, the spring will snap. So what does elasticity look like for a spring? Uh, recall in general that you can write that the stress is equal to some modulus of elasticity times the strain. And that is at least true in the linear region. What, what happens is that you can therefore rewrite the uh, modulus of elasticity as the ratio of stress to strain in the linear region. And specifically, if we're talking about length elasticity, this modulus is what's called Young's modulus Y. And so Young's modulus y is force per unit area divided by change in length per unit initial length. So let's consider what each of these terms mean in a spring. Well, the initial length x0 basically corresponds to L0. So the initial length of the spring is this L0 term in this equation. The amount that the spring stretches by, in other words, the, the displacement from equilibrium, and this is true for stretch or compress, is for a spring written delta x and it corresponds to the delta L term. The amount of external force applied, F, is also uh, a direct uh, thing that can be translated easily between spring and generic elastic material. Force, force. So usually you attach a weight to the end of a spring and it stretches under that much weight and we write F equals mg if you're near the surface of the earth and that is the force that is being applied to the spring and therefore it's the force that goes in this equation as well. So what we're left with now is for a spring the thing called spring constant and for this equation relating stress and strain and Young's modulus, we're left with the Young's modulus and the area. So the spring constant Ks kind of sort of measures something similar to the bulk modulus. The bulk modulus is actually how stiff 
is an object. So y represents sort of the stiffness of the object or the stiffness of the spring. Well, ks, it turns out, is the stiffness of the spring, but it has to be modified by some area factor. It's essentially the cross-sectional area of the spring. So let's look at what you get when you actually apply forces to springs, or alternatively, when you actually stretch a spring out, what kind of force it will apply. For the ideal spring, you get something that looks essentially like this. So the, the more you stretch the spring out, the more force it applies, and it is in fact in the linear region that we're interested. And so you have some equation that basically looks like force that the spring applies is the spring constant times the amount of displacement from equilibrium, which I'm going to drop the deltas and just call x plus some initial force. Why is there a plus some initial force? Well, in the actual lab, what you often find is that you can hang quite a bit of weight from a spring before it even begins to stretch. So for example, you might hang one newton from the spring and still get a stretch of zero. Two newtons still get a stretch of zero. Three newtons, all of a sudden it's stretching. And so you end up with a line whose intercept might be, let's say, two newtons. Well, that's what this F naught term is. So um, this leads us to what's called Hooke's Law. So this, this graph right here is graphing essentially force being applied to the spring versus stretch with the axes kind of flipped so that this is really the uh, independent variable and this is really the dependent variable from an experimentalist perspective. What that basically means is that you're applying more and more force, you're getting more and more stretch. Now the reason why these axes are flipped is going to become apparent in a moment. Um, before going back and explaining that though, it's worth also seeing this little diagram to see what's meant by displacement from equilibrium. So here's the spring at equilibrium. It's unstretched. There's no weight attached. You attach some weight. It stretches out a little bit. This is weight number one. This is x number one. You apply a little more weight. You get a little more stretch. So the more weight you get, the more this thing stretches. And you can even sometimes compress it and measure how much force you're applying to compress by, for example, flipping this upside down and putting the weight on top of it. Okay, so be that as it may, the reason why the axes are flipped is because what we're really interested in is how much force the spring itself is going to be applying. And to get that, you use Newton's third law. And recall that Newton's third law essentially says that the vector F12, force that object 1 applies to object 2, is negative of the vector F21, the force that object 2 applies to object 1. So that's the action-reaction law, um, or action-reaction force law. And so basically, written out, it might look something like this. The, the force that the spring is actually applying is equal to the negative of the force that is actually applied to the spring. So that means same magnitude, opposite direction. So this means that really what we're interested in is how much force does a spring apply to an object as a function of how much you have stretched or compressed the spring. And so that's why the axes on that graph are actually flipped. Because um, to answer that question, this actually becomes the dependent axis. You could think of it in, even as I grab onto the spring and force it to stretch out to 0.1 meter longer than its initial length how much force is that spring applying to my hand, which also happens to be how much force is my hand applying to that spring just in the opposite direction. So what Hooke's Law ultimately says in vector form is something like this. The force that a spring is applying is negative Ks times x minus F0. So this F0 again is how much force you would apply before the spring begins to stretch or compress at all, mostly before it begins to stretch. Usually it is 
F0 is zero if it is a spring that you can compress because it comes into play because there is some um, normal force between coils on a tightly coiled spring even if there is no force applied to the end. And so essentially you apply force to the end, it starts loosening the normal force up, then it begins to stretch when the normal force hits zero. Uh, in its traditional form, this would look like F equals negative KS x and you'd put a zero for this term here. So the minus sign is important. It is in fact indicating that you have an elastic restoring force here. And um, again reminder we're interpreting x here to mean displacement from the equilibrium position where the equilibrium position is x equals zero. Um, and we're essentially assuming that all we're doing is applying a force to it. Uh, it gets a little more complex if you actually want to make an oscillator because then you have, for example, a weight that is initially displacing the spring and then you have to give it some additional displacement before it starts oscillating. So to summarize a little bit, what is uh, Hooke's law? versus the elasticity uh, equation for a spring. Well, for an ideal spring, you have this force equation. This is actually Hooke's law. And so Ks looks like the force of the spring divided by the, the displacement. Young's modulus says that Y is F over A uh, divided by delta L over L naught, force divided by cross-sectional area, all divided by the stretch per unit initial length. So this force of spring and this force in this equation for the spring are the same thing. And again, X and delta L are essentially the same thing. So you can um, take the ratio F over delta L and solve this for that, solve this for that as well. So KS must be Therefore, y times cross-sectional area divided by initial length. Young's modulus, cross-sectional area, initial length. So there's a couple things that we can get out of that that are maybe interesting effects. One of which is that if you take two identical springs and attach them end to end, in other words, you attach them in series, you're essentially lengthening the overall spring. And so the spring should act the same as one spring would have, but with twice the value of x naught and therefore half the value of ks. And similarly, if you place two springs side by side, in other words, they are in parallel, and these two springs are identical, you have effectively doubled the cross-sectional area, and therefore you have effectively doubled the spring constant. And you may want to spend some time thinking about whether or not you've ever seen or can think of a case in which each of these two um, things are rigged uh, in real life. Offhand, I can tell you quite a few examples in which springs are placed in parallel. Um, for example, if you have a spring mattress that consists of a lot of different springs in parallel, Shock absorbers on a bike or a car usually are two, or in the case of a car, maybe four springs in parallel. As for springs in series, one application is that if you cut a spring in half, you're essentially halving the value of the length. It means that you should have twice as much spring constant. Okay, so there is one last topic that I wanted to talk about that has to do with springs as such, and that is the potential energy function for a spring. Now, you'll recall from your Physics 1 course that the potential energy of a system is essentially A, an energy function that goes with a system. In other words, there has to be at least two objects present. In this case, you have, for example, the spring and um, usually the, the two ends of the spring, for example, or the spring and a mass is usually even a better way to think of it. Uh, secondly, that 
it has to involve the presence of a force between those two objects and specifically that that force must be a conservative force. So as, as it turns out a spring uh, has a conservative force for the Hooke's Law force. Conservative force basically just means that the amount of work done to get from point A to point B only depends upon the relative position of A and B or the displacement between A and B and not on the path taken to get from A to B. So that's true about a spring. If you uh, stretch a spring out and release it and it compresses and then restretches, the only two points that matter are the initial amount that it was stretched by and the final amount that it's stretched or compressed by. And so your potential energy function for a spring is going to be some function of the spring's position. In this case, it's really the displacement from equilibrium for the spring. And before talking too much about this, so you can see the equation down here at the bottom. The potential energy of a spring is one half of the spring constant times the displacement squared from equilibrium. And uh, before moving on to talk about that in context of conservation of energy, it's worth remembering that the previously you have been exposed to a different type of potential energy, which was the potential energy due to gravity. And that one near the Earth's surface looked like m times g times delta h, or m times g times h, where h equals zero is what you're defining to be the ground. So recall that you get to define what the ground position is for your system. So in the context of gravitational potential energy, what that looks like is that you may be dropping an object onto a table, which is itself sitting on the floor of the third floor of a building. So where are you going to define the ground to be in all of that? Well, you could define it to be the literal ground outside, in which case you have to calculate all of your heights with respect to the literal ground outside. Or you could say, well, the floor is close enough because the object's never going to fall through the floor. Maybe it's a little rubber bouncy ball and you are in a, you know, it's a sturdy floor. You're not going to drop a rubber bouncy ball through the floor. Okay, well, now you've got to define all of your heights with respect to the floor. But since you're actually just dropping the ball on a table, you might as well pick the table to count as the zero potential energy point or the ground point. So all of your height is how high above the table is it? Well, the same thing works out with a spring. Usually we define, if it's just a, a spring and nothing else present, we would define the ground for the potential energy of the spring to be the position uh, where the spring is at equilibrium. Sometimes it's convenient to pick a different point. For example, if you have a bungee jumper who's jumping off of a bridge, there's also gravitational potential energy present, and so you can decide whether you're better served by making zero the uh, ground, whether you want to make zero the bridge, whether you want to make zero the uh, point at which the gravity and the, the bungee cord spring force are balanced, uh, you basically have to make that decision. Let's go ahead and put the potential energy associated with a spring into the context of the conservation of energy in general. So recall that energy conservation basically says that the initial energy of a system plus any work that's done on the system by propulsive forces is going to equal the final energy of the system plus any work done by the system via non-conservative forces or dissipative forces. So for example, you might have an equation for a given system that looks something like this. The uh, potential energy for a spring plus the potential energy for gravity plus the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy of your system at the beginning plus any propulsive work done is going to equal the spring plus gravity potential energies 
and the translational plus rotational kinetic energies of the system at the end of the uh, time that you're uh, looking at the system for plus any work done by dissipative forces. So what might be an example that uses all of these terms? Um, there's not very many that are going to make use of all of these terms together, but if you really want to, I guess you could have a uh, bungee jumper who has a rocket pack attached to his back who also decides to um, twist and twirl as he jumps off of the bridge. And there's air resistance. So where do all these terms come into play? Well, you have a potential energy from the spring, which is thanks to the bungee cord. You have a potential energy due to gravity, which is thanks to the fact that he starts off on a bridge and is jumping into a ravine below. At some point in the motion, he is moving, uh, translating. If he's twisting and turning, there's also some rotation. The propulsion force would be thanks to the rocket pack. The dissipative force is thanks to air resistance. So you can, in fact, use all these terms together, although most problems are a little more uh, mundane. For example, this uh, pop gun could be pointed up in the air and fired, in which case you have a potential energy due to the spring, a potential energy due to gravity, and a kinetic energy. And maybe there's also some friction between the ball and the um, barrel, in which case you have either rotational kinetic energy or if it's a block-shaped ball, there might be some work done by the friction. So that's basically it as far as the basic properties of springs goes. I will go ahead at this point and work a couple of short examples, um, just two though. So our first example, we have a spring that stretched 0.1 meters from equilibrium if you apply a force of 20 newtons and then it stretches 0.3 meters from equilibrium if you apply a force of 40 newtons. So the question is what is the spring constant? And this question isn't necessarily referring to this diagram and in fact you can see that this diagram the actual forces that are plotted here don't go with the numbers in this uh, problem. In fact, this diagram goes with the second problem, but we can make reference to this diagram to help us answer this problem. Because what it is essentially saying is that there's going to be a non-zero intercept if you were to plot um, spring force versus displacement. So the graph actually will look like this graph, but maybe with slightly different numbers on this axis. So you have the point um, 0 0.1 meters comma 20 newtons and you have the point 0 0.3 meters comma 40 newtons on this line. So basically if I was going to try to sketch this line out, um, the line might look something like this. Here's the force uh, that the spring is applying in newtons, or the force applied to the spring in newtons and here is the displacement in meters and you end up with some line that looks like this and we've stated that there on this line ends up being the point um, basically 0 0.10 meters comma 20 newtons and then similarly there is the point 0 0.30 meters comma 40 newtons so recall that the equation that you have for Hooke's Law looks something like this. Uh, dropping the vector signs, it might look something like this. Ks times x plus f naught. Alright, so looking at this equation, it has the same general form as y equals mx plus b. So the spring constant and the slope should be equal. So find the slope of this line and you've got the spring constant. So therefore, Ks should be equal to um, 40 newtons minus 20 newtons divided by 0 0.30 meters minus 0 0.10 meters.
and so that's 20 newtons divided by uh, 0 0.20 meters and so that looks like the spring constant is about uh, 100 newtons per meter. Note that that's the same unit by the way for what it's worth as 100 uh, kilograms per second squared. So those are equivalent units. That latter thing might be important for us later though not really in this particular lecture set. Okay let's consider the other example which actually does go with this diagram specifically. We want to know what the potential energy of the spring is when it's stretched to 0 0.50 meters. So that's basically right here. So how can we get that? Well, one way of doing it is to consider this equation, the 1 half ks x squared. The problem is that this 1 half ks x squared equation is assuming an ideal spring. The ideal spring, in other words, has to have an intercept down here at 0, 0. So how is it that we can get the potential energy for this spring when it is at this point here. The answer is that remember that potential energy is the potential to do work. So potential energy is going to be uh, total work which can be done. And specifically total work which can be done moving uh, from initial position uh, to the equilibrium position. So to equilibrium position. So how do we get that off of this graph? Well, in general, the potential energy um, which may be PE or E sub P or a lot of sources like to use a capital U can be obtained by integrating F of X DX. So what is that equivalent to on this graph? Well that's equivalent to finding the area under this curve. So we're basically looking for this entire area from zero up to this point um, which is at 0 0.5 meters. So looking on this thing right here, this point right here looks to me like it might be um, halfway between 200 and 250, so we could call that 225 newtons. And so we could divide up this uh, shape into a uh, triangle and a rectangle. So our rectangle, which is down here, has a height of 100 newtons. Our triangle has a height of 125 newtons. Both of them have a base of 0.5 meters. And so this potential energy equation ends up looking like 100 newtons times 0 0.5 0 meters plus 125 newtons also times um, 0 0.5 0 meters but it's a triangle so we need to also take a half of that. Okay so if you do all this stuff what you end up getting is that this term gives you 50 newton meters or in other words 50 joules this term right here gives you uh, 31.25 joules. And let's be honest here, we probably don't have three significant figures right here worth of information. We could probably guesstimate it to about two significant figures reasonably. And so what all this is going to give us is that the potential energy is probably approximately 81 joules. And that's how much potential energy this spring has when it is here at uh, 50 
centimeters or 0 0.50 meters. Um, a related question, which I'm not going to really answer, is how much work does it take to move this spring from one point, let's say from 50 centimeters, out to another point, say 60 centimeters? And the answer is that you can find that by essentially finding the amount of area underneath the curve between those two points. So in other words, what is the area of this blue section here? So a common request that I received for the Physics 2 class was to put a set of um, summary of new terms and equations in it for an introductory level class that seems like a reasonable thing to do. So here is a summary of the new terms and equations that I introduced in this course. Um, the stress and the strain were introduced here, although if you took my Physics 1 course or if you've done the lectures sets from my Physics 1 course, you already know what those two terms are. Uh, the Young's modulus is the modulus of elasticity for length and it can be related to the spring constant using an equation that looks like ks equals y times a over x naught, where y is the Young's modulus, a is a cross-sectional area, and x naught is the initial length of the spring. Um, more importantly, the spring is itself governed by Hooke's law, which takes this form in general, and in the case of an ideal spring, F naught is zero, and so you end up with Fs is Ks delta x, where delta x is a um, displacement. Um, I, you may notice that I've switched notation here in the summary slide. That is kind of intentional. It's, it's basically because different books or different sources tend to use different notations here. Some of them will use a delta x, some will use an x. So I'm going to go ahead and use the delta x here. Um, I used just simply x previously. And that's to remind you what this term's definition is. It's displacement from equilibrium. And similarly, the potential energy, which some sources use EP, some use PE, some use U. The potential energy is one half of the spring constant times this displacement from equilibrium uh, just the magnitude of the displacement squared. Uh, last but not least, I mentioned that springs can be combined in series or in parallel, and you can figure out what effect that has on the spring constant by looking at this equation. So if you combine them in series, you're essentially changing the length. If you're combining them in parallel, you're essentially changing the area. So that's it for this first lecture set in the Physics 2 course. Um, here are the basic references that I've used um, for figures in this particular lecture um, or this part of the lecture. There's a few references on here and almost always there are a few references that don't make it into the video itself. They're still getting credit because they are in the full set of notes that I uh, sort of hand out to everybody in class uh, via Blackboard and or because they make it into the quiz questions which show up in class but not here on these videos. So thanks for watching today's video and I hope you found it helpful.